In this video, we're going to consider how the Federal Reserve has four key tools in the United States for manipulating the money supply and conducting what we call monetary policy. We're going to show that approach to monetary policy with a loanable funds market graph and an aggregate supply aggregate demand graph. First up, we have the loanable funds market. And we're going to consider the case of using open market operations to conduct monetary policy. So when the Fed shifts to a more expansionary monetary policy, we're trying to boost the economy forward. It usually buys additional bonds, right? So it's buying bonds, which then expands the money supply. When it buys bonds, it's giving money to the former bondholders, the individuals in the market, and it's taking bonds out of the market. So more money is now filtering through the economy. It's buying bonds, so it's taking money and purchasing bonds. That money is now in the economy in the hands of the people who used to hold on to those bonds and have ownership of them. This expands the money supply, and what happens in our loanable funds market then is we see an increase in the money supply. This increase in the money supply it provides bank with these additional reserves and the loanable funds market then has this shift out of the supply curve, which then decreases the interest rate that we face in this economy. If we look to see open market operations, but now with contractionary monetary policy, we can go the other way. When the Fed is looking to do a more contractionary monetary policy, it's trying to rein in our macro economy, what it's going to do is it's going to sell bonds. This is going to decrease the money supply. It's going to provide banks with fewer reserves. It's going to decrease the loanable funds supply curve. And our outcome from this is we're going to end up with a higher interest rate. That's going to be the real key that we're looking at here. So we've seen kind of expansionary uh, monetary policy with open market operations and now contractionary open market operations in our conduction of monetary policy, right? And we've shown this with the loanable funds graph. Expansionary, what happens is we increase the money supply and that lowers the interest rate. Contractionary monetary policy, on the other hand, it decreases the supply and increases the interest rate. So how does expansionary monetary policy impact our aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph? Well, we could imagine a situation where we need to boost the economy forward, where our equilibrium is below our potential output. And we say, all right, well, we want to do expansionary monetary policy. And we're going to do open market operations. That's the traditional kind of approach to this. What's going to happen on our aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph? And how does that relate to what we just showed with the loanable funds market? Well, if we're using open market operations, the first step for expansionary monetary policy is that the Federal Reserve will buy bonds. What this does is it increases the money supply. And as we showed on the loanable funds market, that increase in the money supply decreases the interest rate. Now, when we get a lower interest rate, we can think back to our aggregate demand and our short run aggregate supply curve shifters. When we have a lower interest rate, that shifts one of these two curves. You can pause the video and try and think what's going to happen. But it should be rather obvious from the way that we have this set up. If the interest rate is dropped, what's going to happen is investment and consumption will increase. If we have higher investment and higher consumption, we're going to boost aggregate demand out. Now, why are investment and consumption higher with lower interest rates? Well, if you have to pay a lower rate to borrow money, to invest in new capital, to invest in new business you know, ventures, or to purchase large scale consumption purchases, it's going to be easier with a lower interest rate. So investment and consumption rise, which causes aggregate demand to rise as aggregate demand is equal to C plus I plus G in a closed economy. We could also conduct expansionary monetary policy and move the aggregate demand curve out with our other three key tools that the Federal Reserve can use. 
we could decrease the difference between the discount rate and the federal funds rate. We could decrease the reserve requirements, or we could decrease the interest paid on reserves. All right, so now's a little chance for you to quiz yourself, put your notes away, don't look back in the video and see if you can do this. Can you draw two corresponding graphs, the loanable funds graph and the aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph, and explain how the Fed would use open market operations to implement restrictive monetary policy in an overheating economy? Can you draw both of the graphs that would show this and explain how this would all function? The story goes like this for restrictive monetary policy when we use open market operations. First off, the Fed sells bonds. When it sells bonds, this drains reserves from the banking system. When the Fed is selling bonds, what happens is it is taking money out of the economy because people are purchasing the bonds from the Federal Reserve with that cash. So the Federal Reserve is sucking cash out of the economy. It's draining reserves from the economy. It's draining reserves from the banking system. And what happens here is then the supply of loanable funds will drop. And when the supply of loanable funds drops, this puts upward pressure on real interest rates. And when we have higher real interest rates, what happens? Well, we end up spending less on large scale consumption and in investment. So what our story is so far with this open market operations and contractionary or restrictive monetary policy, the Fed is selling bonds that decreases the money supply, which causes the interest rate to go up. And when our interest rate goes up, we drop investment and consumption. So what happens to our aggregate supply, aggregate demand picture? That's right, the aggregate demand curve shifts back down. So this is our restrictive monetary policy with open market operations. All right, one more question to challenge you. Think about this. How would the Federal Reserve apply the other three tools that we've discussed in order to implement restrictive monetary policy? Go ahead and pause the video and then come back and see if you've got it right. In order to conduct restrictive monetary policy, the Federal Reserve can do three other things other than open market operations. It can increase the reserve requirements, increase the discount rate relative to the federal funds rate, and increase the interest paid on reserves. Now, why would we ever wanna do restrictive monetary policy? Well, if the economy is ever overheating, it can help us stave off inflation, as we'll see. If the economy is at full employment, we wouldn't wanna do restrictive monetary policy as we could cause a recession. So it's very important that we time monetary policy correctly. We also have to worry about doing too much expansionary monetary policy. We'll talk about too low of interest rates and in the role of expectations in the future when it comes to monetary policy. But for now, we'll use the toolkit we already have, the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model, to think about why too much expansionary monetary policy is problematic. If we conduct expansionary monetary policy in an economy that is in a situation like this, where we're already at our potential output, our full employment equilibrium here, then what happens is, say we're conducting open market operations and the Fed goes ahead and buys some bonds, which increases the money supply, it lowers the interest rate, and it boosts aggregate demand further out. What happens? Well, we do increase output, at least in the short run, and the price level goes up a little bit. But as the economy expands and we are beyond full employment, what happens next is problematic. What happens next is that now we are above our full employment level of output. We are above the trend line of our business cycle and the economy is overheating. We are in a boom. Resource prices will start to rise. That is the long run story of our aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. And as resource prices start to rise, well, that is one of the shifters of our short run aggregate supply curve. So if we are at a point where we are at price level two and output Y2, then we are booming in our economy, resource prices, in particular wages will start to rise and that will shift our short run aggregate supply curve back to the left. So what happens is that in the long run, we just increase the price level. We temporarily increase our level of output, 
but that doesn't last that long. And in particular, when we are overheating in our economy, that change from short run aggregate supply one to short run aggregate supply curve two happens pretty quickly because resource prices are pretty flexible in the upward direction. People are very willing to take a raise in their pay, right? So wages can rise pretty quickly. Resource prices tend to increase pretty flexibly, uh, at least compared to uh, how they do when they are trying to move in the downward direction. So if we are overheating in our economy at that price level two and output level Y2, resource prices are gonna rise pretty quickly, which is gonna shift our short run aggregate supply curve back quite quickly. So we reach the long run pretty quickly. This is basically the long run self-correction of the aggregate supply aggregate demand model. We move back to the long run aggregate supply curve. So all that we've really done when we've done expansionary monetary policy at the full employment level YF at price level P1 at that equilibrium point is temporarily expand the economy out to Y2, P2, and then very quickly it will shift over to P3, YF. So we're back to the same level of output, but now we have quite a bit of inflation. And so we have to be worried about that. So we don't wanna conduct expansionary monetary policy all the time or anytime when we're already at full employment. So this is in essence how monetary policy works. And we could be a Keynesian activist monetary policy advocate if we were one who wanted to counter the business cycle with monetary policy. If we ever got too low, we could do expansionary monetary policy to move the economy back out. We're in a Keynesian way driving aggregate demand once again. And if we were ever overheating our economy, we could try and drop aggregate demand down to stave off the problems of inflation and to bring us back to the full employment level of output that we have. We could counter the business cycle in the same way that we could use fiscal policy to counter the business cycle. But as we said, the Keynesians kind of turned away from fiscal policy advocism, activism and towards monetary policy activism. And so this was kind of the 50s and 60s, the main form of countering the business cycle, the camper approach, the Keynesian activist monetary policy approach. Now today, activist monetary policy is still quite popular. And so this is a school of thought that we want to pay attention to, but it was really in vogue in the 1950s and 60s, and it had become the predominant theory or the predominant school of thought in macroeconomics. Click on the thumbnail to continue on in this lecture series to find out more about macroeconomics.